Hi everyone, welcome back to lesson 15 from Miss Ellis's at home, at home learning with Miss Ellis. I don't know, I say it different every time. Um, so these are lessons I've been recording for families because a lot of the learning uh, that we are able to give kids is pretty passive, you know, watching a video or um, reading something and writing maybe, but there's not that same interaction that you would normally have in the classroom. So I wanted to find a way to give you that interaction, but with a teacher's input in terms of like what to do. So these are interactive read-alouds, which normally in the classroom, what that would mean is like I ask a question and we sort of talk about it. And then, you know, it's very, it's more like a conversation between 20 something people. So it's very um, interactive. <laughs> so all I can do is provide the structure or the scaffolding on which to do that. But then it's really up to you, family members, to facilitate that conversation and do the like archival, archaeological digging that we would normally do. So <clears throat> I will ask you these questions and it's really up to you to like get to that point. Make sure they're finding that evidence. Make sure they're able to explain their thinking. That's where really you come in to do the real teaching part. So I'll give you the structure and then it's up to you to like bring it out so um yeah so that's it if you're just joining me for the first time welcome um I strongly suggest starting back at lesson one just because a lot of the ideas are building across the units but either way give it a try um we are going to be continuing the work we started in the first two of this mini unit right so this is the third out of four so we started um <clears throat> three things we started um, keeping track of polar animal adaptations, right? How are animals adapted to survive in a harsh polar climate? We're going to move into desert. Oh, there goes the groundhog <laughs> running across my yard. Um, we're going to move into desert habitat now. And then I put grass in here just in case if you had another, you know, if your child became really fascinated by this and you wanted to keep going, you could find another habitat and keep going with that same type of research. Make as many columns as you want, in fact. Um, so we're continuing with that. We're also going to continue with your glossary. Now, I strongly suggest, um, especially if your child is learning English um, or if maybe language hasn't been their strength, I really could not recommend more keeping this glossary. In fact, you might want to, <clears throat> pardon me, either get or make a little notebook and have them have that be the glossary. And they can use that across all their subjects as you do this at home learning. And basically the idea is you could either, if you were to do a notebook, you could alphabetize it, you know, take one page and put a capital A at the top, the next page put a capital B. And then as they come across words, they can just write that word and underline it and then define it <clears throat> on the correct page. So a word that begins with B would go to B, et cetera. So they're basically making their own little like dictionary, but it's such good practice because it's A, executive functioning skills, which is basically the ability to like organize and prioritize and make decisions. Um, and it's also, you know, uh, monitoring and managing something over time. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm sorry. That's a really important skill. And then it's also all the language that they're getting from it. So that's just one idea. I really think that's a great um, tool for learners. So, but if you're just doing this for this mini unit, <coughs> pardon me, no problem. Just keep going with this list. Have them write that word and then a kid-friendly definition, having them put it into their own words what that word means. So that we're continuing. And then we're also going to keep referring to the features of nonfiction. Now, the last two lessons, I pointed out times when you, we found a feature of nonfiction that we could add to the list. So I went in and just filled in that list for you. Okay, now let me turn uh, this way, sure. So we have table of contents, bold words, captions, labels, headings, glossary, index, and fact box. <clears throat> so those are features we've seen in the text so far. And this is what I was expecting you to sort of do at home, keep track of those features. So as we read these next two texts, we will refer to this and see if we see any of those features. So that's more for reference at this point. <clears throat> so pardon my throat clearing and the long introduction. So now that we have sort of 
got the context of this lesson. Let's warm ourselves up with our um, prior knowledge. So let's go back to thinking about the text we read last time, last two times. So we read Hidden in the Snow and Polar, no, Polar Animal Adaptations. We talked about how those authors handled the material differently. So that's another really higher order thinking um, skill that's super important because a lot of what kids are asked to do on standardized tests now is being able to like critically analyze two things and compare them and being able to notice the craft of writing, the craft of informational giving. So starting to do this now is really smart because <clears throat> the, the sooner you do it, the more it becomes second nature. So we will refer back to this kind of thinking um, next time. All right, that's it. So now let's get ourselves going here. So thinking back to these texts, I want you to just have your child turn to you and tell you everything they can remember about what it's like to live in that habitat and what are some of the adaptations animals have developed in order to survive or thrive there. So pause here, talk together, and then come back. So hopefully by now, as a family, you have, let's see, I'll turn you this way. You have talked together about what you remember from here. You might remember a lot of animals had really thick fur. They had thick blubber. <clears throat> you might remember that they camouflaged themselves. You know, their fur changed uh, from white when it was snowy to brown when it, the snow had melted. So there's all these really amazing adaptations to help animals survive there. So now we're going to move to a new extreme habitat. We're going to think about a desert habitat. Now you might have heard of a desert before, you might not have, but a desert is basically, a lot of people think of it as a hot, dry place, but technically, 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 a desert is just a dry place. I don't know if this is blowing your mind right now or not, but a lot of people get that confused, even grownups. Believe it or not, kids, you probably know something that other grown-ups don't. So <clears throat> now you know. So a desert is a dry place, so they don't get a lot of rain or snow. So believe it or not, this habitat that we were reading about is technically a desert. It's just a cold type of desert. So it's kind of cool. We're going to be learning about deserts now, and it's going to be focused more on the deserts that also are hot and dry, but it might occasionally refer to a cold desert and I didn't want that to confuse you. So it's gonna be talking about deserts. Now, take a minute to imagine the hottest day you can remember. Try to remember what it felt like. What did you do? How did you, how did you spend that day? <clears throat> did you go somewhere? Did you go swimming? Did you have a popsicle? Did you go in the shade? Did you stay inside in the air conditioning? So imagine that hottest day was every day and hotter. So these hot deserts are so hot that it would be really actually dangerous for us to be out in that habitat all the time. So animals have had to learn to survive there because there's not a ton of rain right because it's a dry place there's not a lot of like lakes or ponds or rivers there's some ways to find water but those are real challenges of being an animal in that habitat so take a second and brainstorm try to imagine that so i want you to think about these things right i want you to try to put yourself in that position imagine it were that hot every day and it was that hard to find water I want you to think about what are some animals you might already know or things you know that live in a desert habitat, maybe plants or trees you already know. And I want you to think about what specifically might be some ways animals have learned to survive there, given that it's really hot and it's dry. So just get that activated, try to access whatever prior knowledge you have, and then pause and come back. <clears throat> So hopefully now you are coming back to me after talking together about kind of like predicting what it might be like in a desert. So what we're going to do now is move into actually reading our first text. Now, I don't know if this looks familiar to you. This is called Hidden in the Sand. Does it remind you of maybe this one? So... This is a little mini series of books 
Um, I also have one other hidden in the grass. So that's really fun when you find a series that you like. I know these texts are particularly dense. So it's up to you whether they feel like age appropriate for your kiddo. So here we have <clears throat> Hidden in the Sand. So now the reason I wanted to make that connection is if you remember what this book was like, what the features were. Remember, this is the one that had all those nonfiction features, right? It had table of contents, bold words, right? It had all those things and it made it a really dense and rich text. And so my prediction is that this book is going to be kind of similar. So families, that might mean you want to pause this one or break it into pieces so that you don't get overwhelmed because it is a lot of a lot of stuff. But we have already done a lot of that same thinking already, so it might be a little bit easier this time. So it's up to you. So here we go. Let's start Hidden in the Grass. <clears throat> and this is by Barbara Taylor again. So it's the same author. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm so sorry. It's the same author as um, Hidden in the Snow. So here we go. Do you remember what this feature is called? That's right. It's a table of contents. So it's telling us where to find the different sections of the book. So I'm not going to read that to you only because we're not looking for a specific section. We're going to read the whole book. So it's really up to you if, if a table of contents would be helpful. If I were researching a specific thing, I would look at this to find that section. Hiding in the sand. Animals that live in deserts are good at hide and seek. The animals hide by blending in with the background. This is called what? You should know, you should know, you should know. Camouflage. And hopefully that word is on your glossary because we've definitely come across that a few times. At any point, if you're finding you want to add to one of your charts, just pause the video and do that. Some animals have pale sandy colors. They are hard to see on the sandy ground. The sandy color of Dorcas gazelles hides them from hunters. Now here's a caption that's one of our other features telling us about the picture, right? What's in the picture? It says, Dorcas gazelles live in deserts in the mountains of Africa and Arabia. And here's that picture of the Dorcas gazelle. And then there's labels, right? They tell us about the parts of its body. So this one says fur is the same color as the sand. And then down here it says long legs to get away from hunters. So the main job I want you to um, have as we go through this is really just focus on the adaptations, thinking sort of like this way, right? What are the adaptations of animals that live in deserts? That's going to be the main thinking for you. Spots and blotches. Other animals have patterns such as spots, streaks, or blotches. They are well, <clears throat> well camouflaged in stony deserts. Stone grasshoppers look like stones. A stone grasshopper, grasshopper can hide on the stony ground of its Af African desert home. Here is a caption for this picture. I had to look for this one. It was hard to see. A leopard gecko has spots just like a real leopard. Now here are the captions. Spotted skin. Eyelids for keeping sand out of its eyes. Look at that. Let's see if I can get the eye close to the camera for you. Yep, so they've got those eyelids just like our eyelids. They open and close to keep things from hurting our eyes. And then there's a little fact box. This was actually more of a challenge, like we saw in the other ones, hide and seek. A stone grasshopper is hard to see among the stones. Can you spot one? Let's see, I'm gonna try to put this close. So somewhere in this photograph, they're saying is a spot is a stone grasshopper. Very hard to spot, huh? So here's that heading. A, hem, a heading tells us what that page or that section will be about. This says, sandy animals. Deserts are so dry that few plants can grow there. Now remember, we did this with few trees. So it's not saying 
there's one or two trees, it's saying few types of trees can grow there. There are not many places to hide, right? A lot of animals around where we live, there's a forest habitat probably, and around there, there's so many places to hide. There's logs and you could run up a tree if you need to get away from a predator, but they don't have that option in the desert. There's just not that many things to climb or hide under. Many desert animals are pale brown, yellow, or silver. These are good camouflage colors. Jerboas have a light brown back that helps camouflage them during the day. They usually come out at night. Now you're gonna notice that's a really common adaptation. So if you wanna pause here and add it to your list, a lot of animals have adapted to just coming out at night in the deserts because the sun's not out, so it's not as hot. So it's a lot safer for them. So a lot of animals sleep during the day and then come out at night. And I don't know if you remember the fancy word for that, the word for animals that come out at night. Do you remember? It starts with the same sound as night. Mm nocturnal so animals that are awake at night are called nocturnal and that could be something you write on your glossary families if you wanted so here's a caption about the jerboa the jerboa's white belly reflects or bounces back so that could be a caption a glossary word if you wanted reflect uh, the heat of the sand so because their belly is lighter the heat sort of bounces off of it. I know that's probably a tricky idea, but maybe you did that experiment with black and white paper last time, and you noticed the temperature difference between the white and black paper. <clears throat> so they have a long tail for balance. That was just like the snow leopard, remember? Hairy toes do not sink into the sand. Can you see how hairy their feet are? Look at that and then long legs to leap away from danger. Meerkats. A meerkat's fur matches the sand of its desert's home. Meerkats hunt for insects. So that word is bold. So that tells us that we could find that word in the glossary at the end. You probably already know that word by now. But that's just to, to remind you the bold words are words that we will find in the glossary. So that's one of our features of nonfiction, a way to organize the book. Meerkats hunt for insects, spiders, and scorpions during the day. Meerkats live in groups. Some meerkats watch out for animals that hunt them while the rest of the meerkats play or search for food. So look, there's one meerkat being the lookout and the others are just sort of hanging out while that one watches. There's a fact box. Meerkats can see a bird of prey. So that's another bold word. So if you want to talk about what that means together, a bird of prey is a, a bird that hunts other birds or other small animals. Meerkats can see a bird of prey even if they are looking into the sun. Adult meerkats work together to kill a snake. Now here's a caption about this picture. When danger comes, all the meerkats hide below ground. And there they are in a little burrow. Now here's the caption for this one. Meerkats stand up tall on their back legs to watch out for danger. And then there's two labels for this picture. So let's see what it says. Strong claws to dig for bugs underground and very good eyesight. Now I think we talked about that exact idea in another book, having good eyesight means you can, you can see things pretty far away. <clears throat> and they probably have much better eyesight than humans. Hunting in the sand. Only a few animals survive in the desert. Animals that hunt other animals for food are called what? We learned this last time and it should be on your glossary. Animals that hunt other animals are called predators. The animals they hunt are called prey. A road runner hunts during the day. Its streaked feathers camouflage the bird as it waits for prey. So here's the caption. This road runner has just caught a snake for dinner. 
yummy. And now there's a couple labels. Long legs for running fast. Just like, so far a lot of animals are talking about, they're talking about a lot of animals having long legs. Long tail helps the bird to steer. Hunting at night. Many desert animals hunt at night when it's colder, cooler, excuse me. As it gets dark, cats come out to hunt for mice, lizards, and birds. A sand cat sets out to hunt at sunset. <clears throat> Fact box. Animal talk. Roadrunners are the fastest running birds in North America. Roadrunners can fly for only a few seconds. Sand cats do not drink. They get liquid from the prey that they eat. A sand cat has thick fur under its paws. The fur protects the paws from the hot sand. Now I'm making a connection there. I don't know about you, but I noticed they talked a lot about <clears throat> fur on their paws in this habitat. And it also reminds me of something we read um, from the snowy habitat. So I don't know if you're thinking that way too. I'm going to make a little note so that I don't forget that. Okay, here we go. And there's one label here. Big ears to hear mice under the ground. Whoa. Okay, I'm gonna move in close to do one part at a time. Snake disguises. Desert snakes wait patiently for a meal to pass by. Some desert snakes cover their body with sand. A desert horned viper can sink under the sand in just a few, few minutes. Only its head and horns show above the surface. And here are some labels. Long poisonous fangs for killing prey heat pit, which it's going to tell us about later. And then this is a caption, tough overlapping scales cover the skin of a snake. You probably knew about snake scales. Hunting at night. Rattlesnakes can find their prey at night. They have two special openings called pits below their nostrils. These pits pick up the heat of nearby animals. That's pretty amazing. I'm gonna be a little closer. <clears throat> Fact box. A rattlesnake makes a buzzing sound when it shakes its tail. This warns predators to keep away. Horn vipers make their warning sound by scratching their scales together. Rattle made of loose scales in tail. A horned viper has horns that shade its eyes from the sun. And then they're, they're labeling the horn. So let me bring this up close. Hiding from hunters. <clears throat> Prey animals are less likely to be caught if they are hard to find. If they keep still, their camouflage hides them. Desert larks change color. Ah, uh, uh, connection. Desert larks change color to match the desert sand. The birds that live on light colored sands are pale, and those that live on dark colored sands are darker. And then here's a caption over here. Desert larks are hard to see these tiny birds can stand very still on the ground. Running from danger. Jackrabbits and desert cottontail rabbits run fast to escape predators. The cottontail's white tail warns the cottontails to run away too. The jackrabbit is a type of hare H-A-R-E, not H-A-R. H-A-I-R, excuse me. <laughs> its fur is made up of brown hairs with black tips. 
The fur helps hide the animal among thin desert bushes. Let's see the fact box. A jackrabbit can run faster than a racehorse. A jackrabbit has eyes on the side of its head. They keep it, sorry, they help it to spot danger from all directions. Long ears to listen for danger. A cottontail rabbit uses its long back legs to run away from danger. Oh, and actually, let me tell you, so this is halfway through the text, pretty much. So if you are finding it's a lot, feel free to pause here and come back. Whoa. Disappearing lizards. Horned lizards search for ants to eat during the day. These tiny lizards are hunted by predators such as hawks and snakes. Horned lizards have spiny skin. The colors and patterns on their skin match the sandy ground. So here's a caption. Spikes or spines break up the shape of its body. So all that means is it's harder to see the edge of it because it has these spikes. There's another caption, wide, flat body. Look at that, that is very wide this way, wide. Vanishing trick. A horned lizard moves slowly. It runs a bit and then stops suddenly. And then the lizard flattens its wide fat body against the ground so predators can't find it. Fact box. A horned lizard eats several hundred ants every day. The lizard's tough skin protects it from the ant's stings. Some horned lizards are only three inches. Hold on, we have our tape measure here. Can you show me with your fingers about how big do you think three inches is? Well, let's see. That's one, that's two, and that's three. So if you compare that to like my thumb or my hand, three inches is pretty small for a lizard. <clears throat> Some horned lizards are only three inches long. That's as long as a playing card. And now we've got a picture with a caption. Let's read that. A horned lizard can puff up its puff up its body. It becomes too big for predators to swallow. That reminds me of a puffer fish. Puffer, puffer fish do that too. Eggs, chicks, and babies. Gazelles and other large animals have to hide their, body, their babies on the ground. Baby gazelles and antelopes are often a dull brown color. When they crouch down and keep still, they look like brown rocks or bumps. The dull colored fur of a baby gazelle blends in with the grass around it. Caring dad. Many desert birds lay their eggs on the ground. The female sand grouse lays spotted eggs. She keeps them warm in the day and the male looks after the eggs at night. When they hatch, the chicks are well camouflaged. The parent birds often fly a long way to find water. The male bird wets his tummy feathers and then carries the water back to his chicks. Sand grouse parents may fly more than 99 miles every day. Sand grouse chicks can fly to watering holes when they are four and five weeks old. A female sand grouse is well camouflaged against the ground. Two sand grouse chicks wait for their parents to bring them water. Okay, this is called Spot the Difference. Fennec foxes live in Africa. Kit foxes live in North America. Even though these foxes live in very different parts of the world, it's hard to tell them apart. 
Can you tell them apart? A fennec fox and its kit fo and a kit fox <clears throat> look the same because they both live. Sorry, I'm gonna have to move this closer. <laughs> A, fe a fennec fox and a kit fox look the same because they both live in deserts and use the same skills to survive. The fennec fox has fluffy cream, a fluffy cream-colored coat. The fox blends in with its sandy home. All year round. A kit fox has a thick furry coat which is brown or gray in the summer. Its fur changes to silvery gray in the winter when there may be snow in the desert. Kid foxes come out at night to hunt for kangaroo rats, snakes, and jackrabbits. Strong legs for keeping up, oh sorry, for leaping up high. Huge ears for hearing prey. A young kit fox first leaves its den when it's about four weeks old. A fennec fox digs a den below ground. The den can have up to 24 entrances. That's unbelievable. A kit fox is about the same size as a cat. Okay, here's our last big page. Changing color. Some desert lizards are very good at changing color to match their background. Patches of color in their skin move to change how the, how the lizard looks. Desert lizards change color for many different reasons. A desert chameleon changes color for camouflage and when it's frightened, uh, fighting or frightened. A desert chameleon turns green when it's on a green plant and brown when it's on the sand. So that's the same animal, just changing its body depending on where it is. Two heads. A thorny devil, so that's the name of this lizard, uh, it's, uh, the thorny devil changes color from reddish brown to black to match its background. It has a false head behind its real one. If a thorny devil tucks its real head between its legs, a predator will attack the false bump. So if you can see it, it's right here, there's false head. So it's just like another big horn, but it, if it tips its head down, it looks like it's its head. <clears throat> We've got some labels here. Sticky tongue for catching insects, false head, and spikes to guard against predators. A thorny devil moves in jerky strides. So that means like a robot almost. Um, so that it looks like a leaf blowing in the wind. Interesting. Can you see the false head of this thorny devil? Okay, so that is the end of that one. But look, those features, there's the glossary and index at the end, right? If we wanna find out what some words mean from the book and if we wanna find a specific section. So you stuck with me all the way to the end, great job. So let's think back to this chart we were keeping. I want you to take a moment to think about what things you would record here. Um, what are some adaptations? So pause the video, talk together. What were some of those adaptations you learned for animals that live in the desert? Record them here. So pause. All right, so maybe you've finished talking now and you're coming back after having written down some uh, notes here. Something that I had noticed, some things I had noticed what I would write here. I noticed a lot of this theme of like big ears to be able to hear, because that's so cru crucial. If you can't see your prey, you might be able to hear them. I noticed some um, animals had a way to sense the heat of another animal in the cold at night. I noticed a lot of them had long legs. They had to do a lot of running. I noticed coloring was really important. A lot of animals were the color of the sand. And even some of the animals changed color, much like our animals in the Arctic habitat. So I definitely noticed a lot of connections. It was really interesting. So now I want you to think about one last thing. Um, this is gonna involve setting up another paper. <laughs> Forgive me, forgive me trees. Um, I'm gonna ask you to set up another paper. In this one, we're gonna start comparing the adaptations of animals in desert habitats compared to ab the, hab the adaptations of animals in uh, the polar habitats. 
So my advice to do that best thinking, my advice is to set up your paper in a Venn diagram like we've been doing. So I set one up here with a picture of the desert and then a picture of the polar habitat, just to remind you in case you've forgotten or in case this is your first one. So a Venn diagram is two overlapping circles and all the things that are true about the desert would fit inside this circle and all the things that are true about a polar habitat would be inside this circle, pardon me. And then therefore anything that's true about both of them would be here. So things in this crescent would be only true about the desert, things in this crescent would be only true about the polar habitat, and things in the middle would be true about both. So pause here, talk together, what would you put? Maybe even do this, like draw out the circles and, and do a Venn diagram. This is such critical um, executive functioning, critical thinking skills. I highly re recommend doing this. So pause here, fill this out, what do you put? Because I'm gonna show you some ideas here and where they would go. So. See you in a minute. Okay, so hopefully now you just recorded on your own. I just wanna show you a few things that I wanna make sure you started to notice. So I even kept some notes while I was reading to you because I wanted to make sure I didn't forget because there were lots of little details. So something I noticed that was pretty common with both was this idea of camouflage. So personally, I would put camouflage here. A lot of animals that lived in the polar habitat were white and then they would change to brown. Animals that lived in the desert would be sort of sandy colored. So camouflage was really important. I noticed that a lot of the animals in the desert had large ears to hear. But when we learned about the polar habitat, having large ears would be dangerous because you could get frostbite. So that would only go in the desert section, having large ears. I noticed in the desert book, it talked a lot about being able to run fast and get away fast. That was not such a big issue for our um, polar animals. So over here in desert, I would write, you know, long legs to run. Something else that I noticed was the, the book we just read talked about having sand, um, furry feet to protect their feet from the hot sand. And also, interestingly, a lot of our polar animals had hairy feet for a different reason. That was to protect them from the cold and to give them grip on the snow. So having furry feet was kind of important in both habitats. In, even if you remember the ptarmigan, the bird even had hairy feet or furry um, feathery feet. Um, I also noticed that, um, what else? Actually, I think that was it. Those are the four main things or five main things that I noticed. So you probably noticed even more than I did. Um, we're going to continue this with our next book as well. So um, hold on to this. I know this one has a lot of notes. I apologize. It is a more intense academic unit, but the next one is going to be a little bit more relaxed. So thank you for sticking with me all the way to the end. Um, I'm really enjoying sharing all this learning with you. See you next time.